I decided to ask out Shayla. Shayla? That sounds like a stripper name. Like a daytime stripper name. Mm, like, good morning, gentlemen. Enjoy your waffles as you walk into the pole. Shayla! <laughs> <laughs> Here in Harlem, being a woman in total control of her life and love. You know, I saw you the other night. Really? That's weird. It's not always easy. Guys, I'm seriously fine. Uh, girl, you know we don't believe you, have you right? You have sprinkles in your hair. Uh -huh. I'm about work, I'm about career, and tomorrow I'm gonna introduce myself to the new department head and make her fall in love with me. Dr. Pruitt, I'm such a fan of your work. I've read all three of your books. Camille Parks. Can I call you back? That, that's fine, Dr. Pruitt. I'll talk to you later. Sorry. Thanks. That is definitely Damien. You look so good. Girl, you messed up. Oh, that's right. You two know each other. Only from the entire year that we dated, Mom. I met a guy who really gets me. You deserve a good guy. Why is everything always about men? What about our dreams? What about what we want? I think maybe you should go. You sure? Holy sh... I think now's a good time to take a little break, don't you? A strong black woman uh -huh. is resilient, independent, and capable. Let's loosen up and have some fun, hoes. She on one. I ain't been a host since 2005. Girl, guys. In 21st century Harlem, we sisters can be fierce, be in charge, call the shots, get what we want. Every woman has value. And you pay it in cash or paper. Whoa, 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 player, don't get comfortable. No one sits until they're at it. You have your own place, right? Of course. Your finances are in order? 100%. You let her be the boss in the bedroom? Each and every time. Just kidding. You can sing. Oh. <laughs> uh, my name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. Today Thank we you. are. Hey, hey. Hey. <laughs> Today we are thrilled to be talking to the very talented cast and equally talented creator responsible for the hit Amazon series Harlem. We're going to kick things off by introducing you to. The AFCA members who are taking part in our roundtable today, beginning with our facilitator, Katia Woods in Philadelphia, Kim Singleton in New York City, KB in Houston still, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, Jill Monroe in LA, Carolyn Hines in Toronto, Rhonda Rasha Penrice in Atlanta, and Mercedes Springer also in Atlanta. I'm going to let you guys do what you do so well, and we will see you on the other side. KB here with Through the Lens of Lady KB. And my question is for Tracy. So, you know, already in your career, you have written some iconic Black comedies, and I am adding Harlem to the list because I absolutely adore it. And what I love is that you just show Black women, you show us in all of our glory and all of our flaws. So can you talk a little bit about what made this particular project so special and what topics and subject matters were you able to explore specifically in Harlem that you hadn't been able to before in any of your other shows? Sure. Well, first off, thank you for that. That was very nice of you to say. Um, I would say Harlem is the most personal project I've ever done. And the reason I say that is because it's the first time that I've actually written my age range <laughs> and my experiences. And it just was coming from a place of wanting to channel where I was in my life. And then also when I wrote it, there wasn't anything like it on the air. And whenever I see like a hole in the marketplace, I try to fill it instead of complaining about it. And I just have always been really passionate about black women and you know our representation. And I just really wanted to create something that showed friends who are messy and complicated. And I wanted to build on you know, things like Living Single and Sex and the City and even Golden Girls. I'm going to shout that, that out too, because that was the, the OG like friendship um, comedy that I loved growing up. But um, I wanted to do something, but do it with black and brown people in it. And I wanted to show New York the way that I had never seen it before, because I feel like with shows like Friends and Sex and City and Girls, we were kind of gentrified out of those shows. And <laughs> the New York I knew was very black and, and brown and culturally rich. And I was just like, I want to be able to put that um, on screen myself. So for all of those reasons, and just for it being a personal thing, I decided to take it on. But um, most people don't know this, but I wrote this before Girl Trip. So <laughs> um, at the time that I wrote it, 
people weren't really ready for the show and they thought it was maybe too niche. That was kind of the feedback was like, it's well-written and funny, but are black women friends like a mainstream idea? And then of course, Girl Strip comes out and makes $150 million. And then suddenly people are like, oh, I guess it is like a mainstream thing. And that kind of opened the door for Harlem, but it was written at a time when I needed it and I um, just didn't see it on the air, but that was um, kind of the genesis of Harlem. Well, incredible. I loved every minute and you are right. Oh boy, is it messy, but I cannot wait to see <laughs> more. So thank you so much. Thank you. Hi everyone, Mercedes here with She Critiques in Atlanta. Absolutely loved the show. Um, so pretty much, okay, cuffing season is upon us right now. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I think Megan's character, Camille, is going to have a lot of women running back to their exes. I'm not, I'm speaking from experience, um, but I want to know <laughs> from the ladies in the cast, is spinning a block to your ex still taboo or are there rules to going back to your ex? Does it depend on the, like the time frame, maybe? See, or, I'm the person that I always ahead. think, oh, I could be friends with my ex. Oh, I could be friends with my ex, sure, but then you become friends with them and you realize that they're still in love with you and mm. then it's problematic. So no, so it's a no for me. <laughs> yeah, I kind of I kind of look at at exes just like across the board, whether it's like a romantic relationship or a friendship, like there's a reason why you left or there's a reason why you split. And so I think sometimes in retrospect, when we kind of think uh, uh, when we bring back the memories of that relationship, sometimes it can be the memories can be imbalanced. So we can think of all the horrible things that happened, but sometimes we forget the good or we can think of all the good things that happened, but then we don't remember some of the things that needed work. And so because of that, it makes it a very tricky, sticky circumstance if you want to revisit an old friendship relationship what have you without having uh first revisited all the things and all the reasons why you might have split up or or all of that so i i, I think i i consider it um uh, thin ice and not impossible but you definitely have to have a full scope of the, what the relationship was and what you want it to be now mm. and also i will say that the, it's more common in the queer community that like queer women will be friends with their exes, queer men, like it's like, oh, we all, not me, but in general, <laughs> it's like y'all all hang together and it's, and there's no judgment. I love that. Um, but I definitely do see it more in the queer community than other people. Uh, y'all are definitely giving me some notes because I am currently um, riding that bike again. Are you really? Yes, girl. Get your oh, bike. Yeah, we have to talk. <laughs> 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 just because right now I am busy and so it's just easier to be like all right this work don't occupy my time while talk. I go do other things <laughs> um so I'm listening I'm taking it in and I'm rethinking some some decisions I just made <laughs> <laughs> but I love that yes. though I love that yeah okay <laughs> <clears throat> um I'm of the same mind as as Grace I feel like you know uh if if it didn't work before and sometimes you know like you know it can be that the timing wasn't right or it can be many other things but if it's like a combat compatibility thing or you weren't getting whatever it may be um in that case I'm like mm, yes people can grow and people can change there's that but I think if it didn't work um the first time you might find yourself back in the same situation mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you so much. You're saving a lot of lives with that advice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Kim Singleton, considered Black Lit podcast and television show out of New York City. And this series is so much fun. Many of aspects of it, I connect with my friends when we hang out in Harlem. Um, I like the chemistry between all the characters. So my question is, do you do anything special to create that chemistry? Like, do you go out and hang out in Harlem before you go on set? Or if you didn't, do you do it now? And that's, it was that's natural, I would say. I know when I when I chemistry read with Grace, we were we were ad libbing some of the same lines, 
And we were talking about, before we even booked the job, we were talking about making Brazil nut milk in Harlem. She said, when we get to Harlem, you got to tell me how to make Brazil nut milk. So it just like was there. Mm -hmm. And then I met Shaniqua and I'm like, oh my God, who is this amazing, brilliant, vivacious woman? I need you in my life. And then Megan, and I'm like, we were thick as thieves, okay? Yes, my role dog. And then I met uh, Tyler and he's a he's from Philly and that in that like brotherly, beautiful, protective energy. And so whatever the combination was with casting, it's like we met each other and genuinely was like, I, I, I love you. I think the question we got asked a lot on set was, are you, are you guys sure y'all never met before this? Mm -hmm. Like you sure, yeah. you sure? Yeah. And Megan and I have, we did. And so we were so excited to, to work together. And we were just saying earlier, just a few months prior, how much we wanted to work together. So that was a treat for us. And then Jerry and Shaniqua, like, we were just like gifted. Like we were just like, oh my God, what a gift to have these girls, uh, you know, kind of join that camaraderie. And it just felt like all of us had been friends from the time we were young. Like we had spanned like seasons of our lives together. Like that's, I, I find that to be really rare, especially as you get older, you know what I mean? That kind of connection, but it, it happened so seamlessly for us. And Tracy, girl, we got you to thank, honey. Okay, yeah. we are so happy, <laughs> we're so, so happy. And I'll just add the chemistry was there. It, it really was. We, we did a, a chem read with everybody just to kind of mix and match and see. And I also, you guys didn't comment on this, so I will. I even like the, the look of everyone. Like I, it was important to me that everybody has a unique complexion and body type and build. And just, I looked at them all together and it wasn't deliberate. And I was like, oh, what a beautiful like spectrum of like blackness. It, it just really was like profound to me in that way. And, and so, and then the fact that they loved each other and got along, I was like, oh, then we have to like do this. Cause it's just already so beautiful to look at and watch. And also the thing that I still remember, I don't know if it was the first day of shooting but you guys praying together was a really special, beautiful moment, but I don't know who was even doing the prayer, but the four of you just knelt down and like, there's like a picture of you guys praying. And I was like, wow, what a great group. And um, Tyler and Megan also just like really, really great chemistry. And immediately when I saw them read together, I was like, oh, this is like a home run, like connection. So you guys are great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank Tyler, you, no, you want to add to I that? Definitely, yeah, for sure. I definitely felt that too. You know, from the from the first chemistry, and you know, I have a unique experience too because I'm I'm the man that's coming into this this uh, this celebratory space of, of these black women, and it's like even for me, I mean, the energy was just like. I mean, I joke with them all the time. It's like, they're, I'm my only child. They're like the sisters that I've always wanted, that I've always needed. Because when I got there from day one, I mean, I had met Megan at the chemistry read and that was that was effortless. You know what I'm saying? It was seamless that we were just in the flow. Um, and a lot of that goes back to, you know, Tracy and casting. They do a great job um, <clears throat> of what they do. But even when I got to the, to the table read, just everyone was greeting me with open arms. And it wasn't just like, um, you know, you could tell they wasn't just being polite to be polite. You know what I'm saying? Like it was actually, <laughs> It was a genuine space that I was walking into. And I wasn't there on the first day when everybody was praying, but I remember on the last day, all five of us, we, had, we were in my trailer and we had, we had, we had a, a prayer, you know what I'm saying? And it was, um, and it was just everything that I needed. And I don't, I don't feel, I don't feel like not one day, not one moment of my experience in this first season ever felt forced. So that's just a blessing. Cause it's not, you're not always in a, in a cast like that. You know, a lot of times you show up, if you don't like them, it's, it's whatever. You, you still got to show up and do your work as a professional. But anytime you can get into a space like this, I mean, it's it's a blessing. Yeah. Awesome. Well, the chemistry definitely comes through. Love, love, love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Happy with a couple of social. Can we talk about Colin and, and Angie's relationship? Uh, Tracy, one of the things, I love the show, but I kept saying in the back of my mind, being like, girl, get a job. Get a job. Well, you can do your thing and get a job. What was the inspiration? And then, and I'm like, because I'm like, if she's your friend, she's going to say, girl, you got 30 days to get a job or keep it moving. So what was the inspiration behind that? And is she going to get a job? Not really. Um, <laughs> but I, I think the inspiration behind that is uh, real life. 
and I'm not gonna like name names, but I definitely have uh, friends and family members that are are highly leaning towards the codependent side of things and just are used to people kind of taking care of them and are not like comfortable uh, pushing themselves out totally to be independent. And for me, like those people exist and they're they're in my friend circles. And and the thing with um with with Grace and Shanique, where they have such great chemistry, but with, with their characters, I think there's kind of an equal codependency going on. In some ways, like I think that Quinn does rely heavily on on um, Shaniqua's character as well. And I think there's a little bit of like, I want you to go be independent and get out of my space, but also please don't leave me. So I don't I don't even know if it's it's totally all Angie. I think in some ways Quinn is a little bit of a of an enabler um, to her not having to go out and get a job. But I think that's a real dynamic that a lot of people um, find themselves in, whether it's um, romantic relationships or uh, platonic, but I think it's just kind of a comedic ex exploration of like a codependent relationship. But she does need to get a job though. She does. If she were my friend, she would get a job. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jill Monroe, YouTube Stiletto Jill. The, this question is for the ladies of the cast. I love the chemistry, as we talked about, of the relationships and the way that the friendships feel familiar yet fresh. What are some of your favorite elements or characteristics of these friendships as a force? Then as sort of we see the them break off into individual sort of situations within themselves as well. For me, it's their ability to put the relationship first. No matter like what's going on, no matter what like um, conflict they may have, there's always an understanding that we are a tribe and we're gonna work it out. Whether you're, whether you're mad at me, you're gonna take this jab or not. Um, whether I'm giving you a little bit of shade, there's always a um, priority to maintain the friendship. And that's one thing that I really like had to learn from these ladies because I'm quick to like go somebody. Um, but it's so important to just like be able to work it out like have the conversation. And I think it's also to like the commitment to just be with one another that I really cherished from these ladies. Yeah, for me, it's, um, it's a safe space. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like, especially in the last couple of years, it's been a very traumatic time for, for everyone. And so finding safe spaces where you can be your authentic self, where you can be vulnerable and transparent and, and show all parts of you, it, it's so important. And I, I really feel like that's what these sisters have with each other is a safe space to cry, to be upset, to be honest with each other, to tell each other what's on our minds. Um, and so, you know, the more I, I see that reflected in my own life, just how much I really value that. And so being able to see it represented here in the show, mm -hmm. I think is indispensable. Hi, Karen. First, here's what happened at Karen and Toss podcast. This, so my question is for everyone, but I want to start with Tracy. Um, one of the things that I really love about this show is how realistic it is, and it touches on subjects that Black women in particular face daily. And one of them is the discussion on uterine fibroids and uterine conditions. And this is something that I personally have experienced. I've had fibroids, I've had a myomectomy, I've had surgeries to remove them. And there is no black woman in, that I know in my life who is above the age of 30 that does not has that does not have fibroids. And I want to ask you about including this in the discussion because I've never seen it discussed in any TV show or film that centers black women. So I wanted to ask you, Tracy, about including this in the storyline and then for the cast about this having this discussion while you're preparing, while you're reading the scripts and then during rehearsal and filming. And for Tyler, I want your perspective as a man because my brother is 10 years older, so he he's familiar with things, but we don't get it. We don't get the, I, the perspective of men in women's lives because you know we have the things like PCOS and endometriosis that do affect black women a lot. And it does affect, I think, the relationships between black women and men. So I want your perspective on that as well from being um, reading, from being involved in the show. And I Tracy, just want to say, go ahead, Barbados. Hey, hey, hey. I hey, 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 hey. <laughs> love, yeah, love the accent. Um, I was <laughs> in the writer's room. It kind of came up organically. And one of the 
black women writers in the room actually was dealing with that. And then that kind of sparked a very honest, vulnerable discussion of all of the stuff that we had been silently dealing with and just showing up with a brave face to work. And I think what was going on was that, and I get it because it's like, it's work and it's professional. So people just feel like they can't really be open and honest about what they're dealing with. And then we <laughs> kind of started tearing up when we realized that there was just personal struggles galore in this room. And the majority of the women in the room were black women. And so we just bonded over the fact that like, wow, we're not allowed to cry. We're not allowed to share these stories. We're not allowed to be vulnerable. We're not allowed to talk about, you know, some of the things that we're dealing with privately. And I think like um, this idea of a strong black woman or um, a, a fierce, like our fearless black woman, I get it. And I think that's great. <laughs> and I think that like the, the reason behind that was well-intentioned, but what it also did was it denied us the permission to be weak and vulnerable at times. And so that that's where the episode kind of came from was all of us just admitting that. And with, with fibroids in particular, I wanted to highlight it because like you said, it is, it's an actual issue that affects black women. And a lot of times when black women go to doctors to get diagnosed or medicated or help for it, they're either misdiagnosed or sent away or dismissed in a way um, that mm -hmm. other women are not. And so that was the reason why we kind of explored that with Ty because in the actual writer's room, it came out that it took several doctors to figure out what was actually the problem. And, you know, and then when the solution was presented, it was, oh, well then maybe you just don't need kids. And it was just very, a harsh like you know discussion instead of a thoughtful nuance like way into it that I think a lot of white women are afforded so that was kind of like the the genesis of that episode and that particular discussion reading that part of the script it definitely was like a moment um just because, you know, in undergrad, I studied African-American studies, right? So there was a lot of stuff about um, Black women who are forced to get hysterectomies or like who don't know that they're getting them as children. And there's like this this history here in America of, of, of trying to not only take control of the Black woman's body, but stop the Black woman's ability to, to uh, reproduce. Mm -hmm. um, and the, our wombs are so powerful. And so it's makes sense for white supremacy, right? Not that it makes sense, but for white supremacy to prevail that they would try to go in um, a black woman and, and, and silence her body in that way. Uh, I have an aunt who has uh, fibroids, who struggles to this day. And it's interesting having conversations with her because it feels like, and she also had a hysterectomy. She also has her ovaries taken, like all of these things that are being done to her body. And it's almost like she constantly, I mean, think about how intimate it is to even like use the restroom with somebody, right? But imagine having different people exploring your body, telling you, oh no, that doctor was wrong. Uh, we're going to do this, but that doctor already took this out of my body. And so now you're going to do this. Oh no. that And so continuing to get second opinions from the same kinds of people who don't care about uh, the longevity of black womanhood in America to begin with. I also have a friend, because you mentioned um, endometriosis, who had to move back here from LA because it is so under research because it doesn't affect men or for what we know right now, it doesn't affect uh, men or male at birth, people who were, who were born uh, male. And so it is sometimes underreported, sometimes it's, uh, it's misdiagnosed as other things and it's not researched enough. And so she had experiences in LA um, where, it just, it got so much worse because people were almost experimenting on her. And if, if we know from slavery time, like black women were experimenting on, that's how we have modern day gynecology and like brain uh, surgeons and stuff like that. It's like, it was explored on, on black babies. And so just, just to have this conversation in the room on a queer masculine performing body, 
-hmm. with the assumptions that come with that mm -hmm. i'm just yeah. I, i'm so I, i'm so excited for the conversations in the forums on that when this show comes out well i think from my perspective um you know, it's, 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 uh, it's unique because on one hand, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't experience this, you know? Um, but in my life, I've had so many, um, <clears throat> family members, friends, people that I know, I've had so many black women talk to me about, uh, feeling dismissed and feeling silenced. And, you know, and you know, like where, where I come into play is like, you know, and Jerry had talked about it, about feeling that protective energy, because when it comes to physical protection, of course, I'm going to be there. But like one one place, I guess that's a different contrast to that, that shows like my juxtaposition is my my ability to like protect in a different a different way to listen, to be tender enough, to be open and, um, you know, just just be there with them as they go through this, because like it's just it just blows my mind that one of the through lines of everything that they've been telling me is that is, is everything that you y'all have been saying, like they're going to doctor after doctor and people are just continuing to dismiss them and, and they feel like they're voiceless. And I, I just feel like, uh, Tracy did such a good job of, of just not only highlighting that specifically, but just the full juxtaposition of who um, we are as people, but who y'all are specifically as black women. Um, it's not just a, you know, cause, cause when, when we see it on TV or you see it on the news, it's like this, yeah, like strong, sassy type of like, you know, one note. And it's so much deeper than that. You know what I mean? Of course there's strength, but there's vulnerability too. There's tenderness to go along with that, that strength. And I just feel like, um, you know, I'm continuing to learn more and more about it, um, even through the work that we're doing on the show. So I just, I mean, you hit the nail on the head and I, I just feel like it was a very, um, I just feel like it was an important aspect to involve into the storyline. Yeah. For the other ladies, anything to add? I mean, I think Jerry said it all, you know, <laughs> um, and I think and, you know, again, just going back to the fact that Tracy and the writer's room took the time to just make this a part of it and to tackle it. And and then, as Jerry said, with all <clears> the window windows that come with that um, specifically, I think that it is going to be a um, a conversation piece that frees a lot of people just like it did in the writer's room yes. to say, yeah, I am dealing with this. I am struggling with this. I feel alone. I know other people are going through it, but I didn't realize how close in essence that, that a lot of times when you feel alone, you don't realize that the people that you need are really that close to you that are experiencing mm -hmm. the same things because you don't have those conversations. So hopefully it opens the forum and I believe that it will to just not be alone in it and um, to be supported and loved and helped, you know, as Tyler said through it. You take your words out of my voice. Thanks, girl. Hey, well, I have five words, so thank you. Oh, Tracy. wow. Yeah, wow. I mean, Kamala Harris, when she was a Senator, she actually passed a bill, um, introduced a bill about um, amplifying research in South Africa for our uterine fibroids. So, it's about time, it does get attention and it makes mm -hmm. it more real because it is one of the things that lots of black women suffer from yeah. and is consistently dismissed. So mm -hmm. thank you. Now, my thank question- Thank you for sharing that, by the way. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, I've, I've participated in a lot of medical articles and done um, like clinical trials and stuff like that. Oh, so, because wow. it's that under-researched. Mm -hmm. But I was interested and why was it important for you to include Black queer women? Because so often when we see these storylines of, you know, girlfriends, college friends navigating life, they're all straight. Mm -hmm. And so I just wanted to know why was it, you know, important for you to include the storyline? And for Jerry, um, you know, what were your feelings? Why was it important for you to portray and what do you think? you know, your character represents? It just didn't feel authentic and right. And also just, it's inaccurate to my actual friend circle. So that was the real reason behind it. It wasn't even political, it just was necessary because that's what my friend circle looks like. And it's multiple um, queer people in my, in my 
circle and orbit and dated. And it's just so organic. And these are people that I grew up with. They're people I went to college with and they're, I work with and like, I'm just surrounded by (laughs) beautiful, amazing um, members of the queer community. And I'm like, I have to. And that was the thing that in looking back at um, some of the earlier shows that you mentioned, it just, I think that was true maybe of their experience at that time, but not true of my experience at at this time. And it wouldn't have felt right for me to not include Ty as a character. And I'm really (laughs) grateful that um, everybody has, I've never had any like pushback or anything about it. It's just like, well, I'm glad that you're doing this. And, And this is a great like evolution of the, like you said, the, the, the straight female friend circle, like, you know, it's, it's important to have a, a character like Ty, but yeah, it wasn't a political thing. It was a, this is my life and this is, it's going to feel inaccurate and inauthentic if I don't do it. And luckily, um, I will be honest, I was super worried about the casting of Ty. I really was because I didn't want someone straight to pretend to be queer. And there weren't that many, and there still aren't, um, and Jerry, you're gonna blow up after this, but there are just not that many like out queer actors of color. And when we were looking at the list, I was like, oh my God, this is, and then it became a thing of, well, are you open to casting someone straight? And I'm like, no. (laughs) <laughs> we should be able to find this person because like it's it's a slap in the face I think if we don't make the effort and then um I, you know I believe in like the universe and fate because maybe two weeks after this discussion I think Jerry moves to LA um and then comes in for casting so I'll I'll, I'll let Jerry talk about that but yeah I'm just it was kind of like tailor-made for you and um, when she walked in, it was like, oh, okay, we found our tie. And then she nailed the audition, thank God. Um, but because <laughs> it would have really sucked if like you came in and like bombed, but, <laughs> but you actually didn't. So it was like, oh, this was the heavens like all aligned for this. And I was really happy because you're fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, I, I feel like what I keep saying is like the writing is so good and so specific that even as I was reading it, I was like, we, we're allowed to say this stuff, which is, which is crazy to think because it's like, we should be right. And, and, and it felt so authentic. Like it took me, like, I just memorized the, the, the scenes very quickly because it was that good. And I'm like, I want other, um, I want to see like more about this story. I want to know more about this character. Um, but I know for me growing up, even like, I feel like even some some actresses that I know uh, to be queer that we know are queer now, weren't able to explore that. So I feel blessed to be able to, to uh, my first big job is like an authentic queer character. And I just know that that tie and, and it's something that I think um, is a testament to the whole team, the whole creative team is that they don't just uh, recreate, right? They elevate. And so even with the fact that Ty is a queer black woman who is the CEO of her own tech company, which is something that, that doesn't exist, right? The fact that that was able to be imagined up and brought to to life, which I feel like is um, we're behind in queer representation, right? Right now is just like recreating stories or or somebody who isn't queer creating a, a slapstick queer character in order to serve the purpose of whatever main character right. it is, and and I'm like I'm completely and utterly sick of the shit. Okay. And so as, as Tracy said, like I experienced so much queerness, so much nuance in queerness in so many of my different friend groups. And so to constantly see black female friends, uh, friend groups of color, and to be like, 
none of y'all like the kitty cat now that is hard to believe i mean the probability <laughs> so i feel like not only did i feel blessed and very much seen because mm -hmm. I, at the end of the day, I'm a Philly John too, right? And I felt like it was like so like gritty and like niggerish in a way that I loved <laughs> when I was reading the character and then coming onto set and having that conversation with Deidre about not wanting to have this character look like any stereotypical queer masculine performing or andro androgynous lesbian, which I'm like, yes, that's the conversation we should be having, right? And I, as a queer woman, I don't dress like any one, I don't dress like any, one day I look like a boy and one day I look like a fashion model. Like it just, it's just whatever I'm feeling in that moment. And I feel like there should be a, a space for that. And so the fact that it was created and there were authentic voices in the writer's room and that I was reading this and I was like, yo, this is real. And sometimes I feel like um, queerness can be associated with um, confusion or like a mental breakdown, like what, like when a, when a character is at her wits end, then she tries to date a woman to see if that'll fix her life right and it's like no there are queer people out here who are loving being queer and who are making that conscious decision every day and what I love about the 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 group as a whole is that it's never like well you know Ty's queer well, Ty's queer. Well, it's not a it's not a it just is right? right it's just a fact and so we don't have to do any extra thing or extra explaining or anything like that we I date just like they date right? The people that I date just, you know, so, so the fact that even that was so real and we've known each other for so long and it's not a thing that I, that we have to think about, right? And now it's so beautiful to be having these discussions, uh, post the show and soon it's coming out. Uh, but on set, it was like, Tracy and I will have conversations. I have conversations with Scott. Like, how do you feel about this line? How do you feel about this? Um, but it wasn't like, it wasn't like at the forefront of everything, you know what I mean? Which I feel like in my life, my queerness is not always at the forefront for, forefront of everything that I do, although it's always subconsciously in the way that I move. Well, congratulations. I mean, you do a fantastic job. I think it's a very important aspect and that, you know, we need to acknowledge everybody in our community. Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you. And all of these women are blessed to be working with me. <laughs> Mercedes here again. My question is for Tracy, but everybody else is also free to, to chime in if you have something. Um, so we've seen filmmakers in the past or screenwriters in the past use a city as almost like a character. We've seen Spike Lee do it with Brooklyn or John Singleton do it with LA. And with the gentrification going on in Harlem now, what was the idea of using Harlem as almost a character in this? And what was the feeling and experience uh, filming in Harlem? I fell in love in Harlem, I think maybe 10 plus years ago. And I it was bliggity black then. And <laughs> just what I loved about it the most, honestly, was when I had Sylvia's and I'm from South Carolina and Sylvia's from South Carolina. And I and I taste it. And I was like, oh, okay. So she, this is this is real soul food in Harlem. And that was my initial connection to it. I know that sounds crazy, but I legitimately care about soul food because I'm from the south. <laughs> and the fact that Harlem just casually had like three or four, and they were like really really good. And I was like, oh, like this this city like has like a lot of soul to it. And I just. I felt the Southern influence coming in. I felt just like the richness of the, the history, you know, with the Harlem Renaissance and even the political history of Harlem. It's just like a really rich, important place. And I was not seeing it at all on screen. Like all of the shows that were like New York set were never filming in Harlem. They were like strategically filming all around Manhattan, but not filming in Harlem. And I was like, I want to like capture this glory and put it on the air because it deserves respect. It deserves a lot of love. And so it really did become a character in the show for me. And then when I came back um, years later, like a, 
I guess a decade later, um, and stayed in Harlem again for a longer period of time, I noticed, I was like, oh, some of the soul that I remember when I was younger is, is leaving. It's looking a little different. And the feeling that I had when I was initially there, it was still there, but changing. And in the writer's room, there was this compass, it was like a compass real estate ad, and it had two white men sitting on a brownstone stoop. And it was like, the, I think it was like, welcome to Harlem was the, <laughs> the tagline. And it got a lot of heat. I, and we were like, oh my gosh, this is so brazen. So we were like, okay, we have to deal with gentrification and we have to just call it out because it's just, we love it, but it's definitely changing. The city is changing and we have to acknowledge the gentrification and the loss of culture and the, the loss of some of the community feel that was there. But um, I, it's still a love story to Harlem and I still very much love the city, but I feel like you can't really talk about it today without acknowledging that the Harlem residents are fighting to hold on to it too. Thank you for holding on to, to Harlem. I live here, so I totally oh, good. can. <laughs> All of that, everything you said. Um, what I want to talk about is the wardrobe. I love the outfits, and I'm just going to touch on, you know, what Jerry said. One day she can dress one way and another way. So my question is, what's the inspiration to the styling of your characters? Um, did the actors have input into it, or did the stylist just say, here, wear this. This is what I think you should wear. I'm going to toss it to the actors because <laughs> I um, they definitely were instrumental in picking their own clothes. And I all of them at some point was on a text chain with me talking about some look that they want to be in or they're inspired to be in. And the only directive, you know, from me and um, from my conversations with Deirdre, who is a, a black woman and our costume designer, and she's fantastic. Um, I just wanted it to be unique looking and I wanted it to be colorful. And just because Camille is an academic does not mean she's not gonna be high fashion and cool. So that was like my directive and I let Deirdre kind of run with it. And then the cast, I mean, they, they'll speak to that but they had a lot of specific ideas about what they wanted too. Deirdre, she, uh, it's interesting because for me, I, I understood who Camille was to a degree and I was still figuring her out and like massaging it. And it was when, um, when I met with Deirdre and we sat down and we went through like the mood board and we talked about certain things. And even then, like some of the clothes in the rack, I was like, this is cool, I like this. But when I put it on, Sheesh. first of all, the fit and just the things that she, that she could kind of see that are, are very unique to her, um, I, I instantly found the rest of Camille just by putting on my clothes. I was like, oh, got it. Okay. This, oh, oh yeah. You know? And I think that's a, a testament to her because I think all of us had a, a similar experience when we really landed in our characters because the, the clothes are also a character mm -hmm. on the show, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, and that's the thing that I love is like, there's such a distinct difference where there's so much of me in Camille in real life, because I am a nerd and I am awkward and all of that. But the the distinctiveness I think is is the world that we've created um, her in, and a, and a huge part of that is how she looks and how she presents. And you know, when I went in and I tested for it, and Tracy was like, "I feel like Camille has goddess locks." I was like, "I'm at the goddess lock shop right now. I'll see you tomorrow." Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it, it's a big it's a big thing. I would have to say the same thing. I, I think for me, it was a bit of a triple whammy because it was about finding something that I could wear because I, I always end up playing characters of affluence. And so it's like, how do you create these characters that come from money that have their own individual style that doesn't feel similar to what you've done before? So there was that element. And then there was also the element of Quinn being a fashion designer. So what is she saying in her clothes, right? So it's like, so it's those two statements. And then the third, thing, believe it or not, was the blonde. Because when mm -hmm. I went in for a fitting and I had my dark hair, you know, we were finding all these things. I was like, oh, that's so cool. But then when I got the blonde, then it was like, oh girl, we can't use you. And so we had to even find certain colors and certain things that would really go with the whole aesthetic of Quinn. And so that was so much fun to be able to find something that, that felt 
because we had to understand who Quinn was, not just as a person, but what she wanted to communicate through her fashion, since it was an extension of herself and her own art. So there was a softness to her. There's like a, there's like an over kind of femininity to Quinn, even though she, I, I think she's a very strong character, but there's a vulnerability to her. There's like a naivety to her. There's a purity to her and innocence. So all these things that we really wanted to show through the way that Quinn decided to show up in everyday life. And another thing that I really loved about Deirdre is that she was really keen on finding black designers. And so we were finding these really incredible pieces and we were like, oh my gosh, girl. And she was like, this from Harlem, girl, this from, and we're like, what? And so we were so we were so enthused to be able to find designers that were black, that were native to New York, that were even native to Harlem to be able to kind of, you know, promote and magnify on our show, which is of course, extremely important to us. Yeah, I think awesome. for, for oh, no, go ahead. Yeah. Um, um, the, the statement, I feel like Ty is, a rich bitch, right? And so her clothes are an extension of that. And working with Deidre, we were having conversations about like, what would Ty wear or what Ty, you know, what Ty wouldn't wear, which she didn't want to put Ty in. But also there were mo like, she would have things on the rack that I'm like, where does that go? And then she'll put it together. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And there was a designer that I love and we couldn't get his shirts and so she started she made a print and started getting fabrics and so a lot of the shirts she just built and i think um the scene when uh quinn is talking about because listen quinn in that hair when that hair come on in the trailer she's a different <laughs> bitch okay don't mess with her uh but that that moment when she's talking about her latest tenderoni um the, that trailer that comes out i feel like that moment is such a is such a great, beautiful, and defining moment um, stylistically yeah. with all of the girls. Like you see yeah. exactly who each of them are in that scene. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyone else, Tyler, who inspired your outfits? Um, <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, the ladies really hit the nail on the head. But I mean, the, the first thing is that um, you know, I love Deirdre because she was open to our she was open to our input, and I feel like um. Sometimes that's when we get the best, that's when we get the best art was, is when there's collaboration. You know, sometimes yeah. people want to spearhead it and just be dictators. And, uh, and she wasn't like that. I think for me, it was important that, um, <clears throat> you know, Ian was in this specific place of, um, you know, here, here he is, he's this very gifted, talented, uh, studied chef. Uh, and he goes, he goes uh, over to Paris to, to bring this whole idea into fruition. So when he comes back to Harlem, it was important for me to, um, have a sense of like, you know, elevation. I want to elevate Harlem. This is why I'm bringing a, um, this is why I'm bringing fine French cuisine to Harlem, even though ain't nobody trying to <laughs> eat my French food. Um, but it was like, it was important to me to have some of that sophisticated look, but still stay grounded from where, I, with where I'm from. You know what I'm saying? So he's going to have some of these pieces that are a bit elevated, but he's still, he's still going to be able to throw, throw a pair of uptowns on and bust down a fried fish plate. Like he's not, he's still from Harlem. You know what I'm saying? So it was like, I felt like, you know, with, um, you know, with my input and, and with Deirdre's direction, like we kind of, we kind of found that we found that contrast, that juxtaposition. Um, so yeah, shout out to Deirdre. I thought she did her thing. Yes. Well done, thank you. Um, this question is for Tracy and it's actually about Camille's character. Having her set in academia and using her lectures as sort of a jumping off point in various episodes, I wanna know what that process was like in the writer's room and did you decide storyline first and then build her lectures around it or was that something that you came in with some of these themes that you wanted to explore through her character and then build the story out from there? That's a really good question. Um, I would say we mostly did the story that we wanted to do. And then like inevitably there was always some kind of theme that was tying it all together. And then we would actually research. We would then be like, okay, so if this is kind of what the episode is thematically about, what's an anthropological take that can weave all of this together. So we never wanted the 
anthropology and the themes to dictate the story, if that makes any sense. We didn't want to be locked in story-wise. So the story always came first, and then we would research and figure out what's a really cool anthropology story or something to like weave into this. And it just was a lot of research. And we actually had a couple of like um, black PhDs come in to the writer's room and talk to us about their experiences. And um, one of my best friends is a, a black PhD professor that I kind of like, I don't say I based Camille on, but like was heavily inspired by her and her life. And yeah, it was just, I thought anthropology was a really cool way to explore modern relationships and, and dating. And I wanted Camille to have like, kind of like a voice or a theme every episode to kind of tie it together. I always really like, um, I guess, dramatic frameworks like that. I think it's always just really cool when you do it. And um, yeah, I, but we always did story first and then um, theme second. Thank you. I love that because um, actually a group of friends and I, when we were younger, that's what we would call anthropology. That's what we would call dating and mm. specialty mm. of different areas. So stuck out to me. Thank you. Oh, thank you. That's really cool. Hi, Carolyn again. So my question is for Sonequa, Grace, and you, Tracy. Um, so before we talked about female, like, you know, um, uterine conditions and about and you spoke about sharing the stories in the writer's room. So there's another aspect of the film of the show that I really connected to. So as I mentioned, I have fibers, but I'm also Bayesian. And there's a particular scene that <laughs> takes place between um, Angie and Quinn that I really, I was like, yes, finally someone says it. Because when it comes to North American productions, when they're doing a West Indian accent, whether the person's supposed to be Jamaican, Trinidadian, or Vincentian or whatever, they always do this weird approximation of a Jamaican accent. And Quinn addresses um, Angie about it when she starts imitating a Jamaican accent. And I was so happy that she actually called it up because she talks to them about it being a form of cultural appropriation because and it's about respect throughout the diaspora. And one thing about female friendships is we can show love, like talking about, like offering sympathy and encouragement during like training times, like with Ty's character, but we also love to be able to be able to call out the people that we love when they do something that we think is offensive or that we don't like. So can you just, for, um, for Sonequa and Grace, can you talk about that scene in particular and about your own experiences where you had to possibly call out someone for something they didn't do? And for Tracy, about the importance of adding that into the show as well, because I think it's something that needs to be addressed in Hollywood in particular, where I like to say, every West Indian is not Jamaican and everybody knows on the same. <laughs> yes. So yes, and um, gosh, there's so many things I want to say about this, and I'll try to see if I can um, uh, keep it concise, but I feel like because you don't see a lot of Caribbean uh, American cultural things that are, you know, on the television, on film, that whenever we do see little aspects, we get excited. So even if it's not like exactly right, we're like, oh, we don't care. We just want to, you know, we're small, we're small countries. We want to hear it. But the truth of the matter is, is that when you're talking about New York, when you talk about the world, when you're even talking about Harlem, there is such a cultural dense part of Harlem of New York that is Caribbean and is legitimately yes. Caribbean. And what I love about Tracy is that when I was cast as Quinn, Tracy pulled me aside and she was like, listen, I really want to lean on your Caribbean American heritage. She's like, I would love to make your parents Caribbean. And I was like, say what? And so doing that to just not bring an authentic, not only an authentic lane to this, to this whole dynamic, but also to to honor that saturated part of New York that does have a very strong Caribbean influence was really important to Tracy. So we talked about it and she was like, do you have a Caribbean country that you'd like to, you know? And I said, well, you know, I'd love to honor, you know, the Cayman route. So I would love to have someone that's Cayman. And she was like, okay. And so we talked about a couple of different countries and then Tracy tried her best to find who she could find that would be able to do a Caribbean accent or who could be Caribbean. And so we eventually landed on Jasmine Guy being an uptown um, Jamaican as mom. And then Tracy was like, and I would love for your dad to be Caymanian. Now he has yet to make an appearance. He will one day. But for the for the first season, we do get to see just an aspect of that cultural representation, which I do love. And so even when we're chatting about it, you know, and, and Tracy and I had a few 
few conversations about how Quinn would say it, what that would look like, like, you know, all those things. But I, I do think that it was really important for us to be able to differentiate just the different cultural um, aspects of what it means to be Black, because there are many different cultural aspects of Blackness that I think that when we address that, then we really include the full diversity and the full spectrum of what it means to be Black. Mm -hmm. And Sonequa? Um, I think so much what I love about this show is that it's giving people the opportunity who would be supporting roles in other shows to have an authentic, fully layered, um, multi-dimensional experience. And even in like, as a black woman, a curvy woman, there's so many times where even in a black production, I've only been like the minor sassy best friend. And so, and that's a, it's a part of um, a way of mocking and appropriating even our own bodies, our own culture. Right. And so that's what I love so much about that scene in particular, which actually ended up being like kind of an add on in the moment or like the day of mm -hmm. having a moment that really explained that no, not it's not okay. Yes, you are black, but what you were doing is mocking this experience. You're not allowing this, you're not, seeing Jamaican people or Caribbean people as a people, you're seeing it as something to um, commoditize. To, exactly. To benefit you right now in this moment. And I think it's just so brilliant, period, about this show is just that everyone, people that we haven't seen before, has a voice, have a voice. They have multi-layers. They have dreams and goals that they are um, aspiring to reach. And I'm just excited for the, like, the level of representation that people will see from it. I love that. It's almost like taking the label of what you think something is and adding the flesh, adding the tissue, adding the ligaments, mm. adding the heartbeat to these to these characters because they do reflect true human lives. Yeah. yeah. No, great. Thank you so much. Because I like I mentioned the fight but also just the, the West Indian and the Caribbean aspect and just like being able to see black women who look like me in all different sh shades and shapes on TV, I think this show is like very important because when we talk about representation, we have to remember it's not just white versus black or white versus other people of color. It's about representation within our culture as well. And you yeah, guys yeah. really do a fantastic job getting a holistic look at what representation actually really means. Yes. yes. Diversity inside the diversity. Yes. Amen. Yes. That's right. Amen. Thank you so much. Finally, we have to end on talking about Whoopi Gober. So can you share how this happened, how you guys felt about working with Whoopi? So I wrote Whoopi Goldberg down as my dream casting. Like whenever you're casting, you kind of like put your dream, at least for me, I try to manifest it, but I went ahead and said, I was like, she's never gonna do this, but can you just entertain me and make an offer to Whoopi Goldberg? And I was like, if she does it, it would like change my life. <laughs> but if she doesn't, it's fine. And I just was not thinking she would ever do it, to be honest. And then when I got the call that she was in, I was like, what? She's doing it? And I just was like stunned. I'm still like kind of speechless over it. And then, um, and, and Megan can attest to this, but when she, the first day she was on set, I was scared of her. Um, because she is Whoopi Goldberg and I think she's a living legend and is just someone that like has played so many iconic roles like every to me yes Sister Mary Clarence is an iconic role I, it really is it changed my life also Seely from Color Purple you know also Ghost like she's just done so many things and is an EGOT just casually an EGOT and I was like I <laughs> don't know what to do with this goddess right here and so finally she says to me you're you're Tracy right and I was like yes and I couldn't believe she knew who I was and she was like yeah I'm, I'm familiar with you and then I just confessed to her I was like I am obsessed with you and I'm just so grateful and honored that you decided to do this and then she realized I was maybe gonna start crying and she was like I don't like all the emotion <laughs> it makes me uncomfortable so I was like yes yes ma'am I'll pull it together but um it really was a big deal it and I think that I think you guys can see it in the show but also the trailer like she just has so much presence just easily when you put her in a scene like she just makes everybody like step their game up and 
Um, you know, Megan got to work with her the most, but I just love the two of them together. I really did. I thought, I was like, wow, what a great pairing that you probably never thought you would see together, to be honest. Um, and I thought that they had so much chemistry and, and Whoopi was a huge fan of working with Megan and the whole experience was just really surreal. But I'm gonna toss it to you, Megan, cause you have to weigh in. <laughs> uh, I mean, you, you, yeah. Whoopi is, and I said this earlier, like she's magical. And she um, is such like an advocate of women empowerment. And like, mm -hmm. you know, we discovered like one day on set, like one of the directors that came on um, was someone that Whoopi had been mentoring and they just finally got a chance to work together by chance, you know? And um, she's just so humble and wonderful and kind, but kind in a very authentic way. Um, and, you know, I, I was saying to Jerry earlier that there was at one point where I was having trouble saying um, Seneca Village. And I was like, Seneca, and it went on and on and on. I was like, why can't I say this right? And I came in the room for my coverage and she had taped Seneca Village in the broken up way across her boobs so that I could read it on my coverage and, and say it correctly. And, um, and so, yeah, she just, she's really, really, really lovely and special. And I was like mind blown to even work with her. And I was, a, um, I was an extra in soap dish when I was 10 years old and I had met her once. So for me, it was like a full circle moment of like, wow. And now we're really working together. That is deep and, and amazing. So, yeah. And, and thank each of you. We love the show and we are certainly looking forward to many, 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 many seasons of it. Yes, yeah. we are too. Thank you. On behalf of the world's largest group of Black film critics, have a great day. Thank you for watching After Rep. Yes. Thank you guys so Thank much you. for the time. Hey, Thank really you. appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks, Tyler. Thank you so much. Wow. All right, see you later, Gil. Good to see you, man. You too, buddy. Good to see you.